bottles of water and that last bit of snack. And we have an absolutely terrific speaker here for you who has, as I, you probably figured out, a familial relationship with Vermont Law School. So it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to Vermont Law School this afternoon. <clears throat> a little bug in my throat there, so apologies. And um, I've got some here, but thank you, Sean. And um, my name's Tom McHenry. I'm the Dean and President of the Law School. Um, I'm also an environmental lawyer by training, so Professor John Nolan has been known to me for many, many years. And it turns out I have a familial relationship with Professor Nolan, which will maybe will not be revealed. Um, so uh, my only task really was to ask you all to sit down, welcome some guests we have from um, the larger community, a, a large group of students. And for those of you who might be visiting, I guess some of our students sit up here and, and uh, watch the proceedings. Uh, Professor Nolan is an extraordinary background, and you're going to hear more about him from uh, Jenny Rushlow in a moment. We are so deeply pleased to welcome him. Our Williams lecturer is really the uh, high point of our environmental lecture series, um, and his work on the Hudson River uh, Valley and his land use work is extraordinary. Uh, his text is, I think, the longest running land use text uh, that exists. And uh, I have his uh, bio and his CV here, and it's 11 pages long, but I'll refrain from reading it. So uh, thank you so much for being here. And I will turn things over to, to uh, the director of our Environmental Law Center, Jenny Rushlow. You have the floor. Thank you. So I have the pleasure of actually introducing what this lecture series is, and then we're gonna hear from Professor Nolan's son, Professor Nolan the Junior, um, about his dad. So to, to start things off, this is the 15th installment of the Norman Williams Distinguished Lecture in Land Use and Planning and Law. And the story of this lecture series and what Professor Williams stood for I think really demonstrate what so many people around the world really dearly love about Vermont Law School, and I think you'll see why as I tell you the story of Professor Williams in this lecture series. The Williams Lecture Series was established through a gift from Frances Yates, who is a former trustee at Vermont Law School, and she gave this gift because her sister-in-law, named Anya, was um, the research assistant for Professor Williams when he was here at VLS and a colleague of his after that. Anya, unfortunately, passed away in a plane crash in 2001 along with her husband, Charles. And um, Anya was the sister-in-law of Francis, and so Charles was her son. And so we're grateful to Francis for the gift that she gave at that time, and, and we, <clears throat> excuse me, honor the memory of Anya and her husband, Charles, as well as Professor Williams. Professor Williams was among a small group of visionaries that 25 years ago took um, the, the nascent law school, the, the little law school that was VLS at that time, and decided that it needed to have a specialty to frame its identity around, and they chose environmental law. And thank goodness they did. Professor Williams identified several guiding principles for the new environmental law program, including that it should have a thorough coverage of the field of environmental law, a strong public policy orientation, and strong ties to the related fields of ecology, economics, and planning, which I think we still maintain. Professor Williams came to VLS in 1975 after a distinguished career in public service and teaching, particularly in the area of land use planning. He was the director of planning for the city of New York City, city of New York, and uh, the executive director of the New Jersey Governor's Advisory Committee on Transportation. And I've heard from Professor Nolan, the senior, that that he knew who Norman Williams was and was a big fan of his work in the earlier days of his practice in land use law. Professor Williams also taught at MIT, Columbia, Yale, and a number of other schools before coming to VLS. He was distinctive in a, num in a number of ways, um, a key one being that he was one of the first planners to observe that the police power could be used for bad. 
um, that it could be used in ways that were actually destructive to the public interest. And this concern for democratic values into urban planning was really instrumental in forming land use law as we know it now, and in particular, the Mount Laurel Doctrine, which uh, students around the room, I'm sure, have on top of mind. So this lecture has been happening for a number of years and a number of my predecessors um, as ELC directors have given a similar talk. And uh, because my colleague Ann Linehan has been here since the dawn of time, she happened to have a copy of one of those. And I'm gonna share with you some words that were said by Karen Sheldon, who was one of the ELC directors that came before me when she introduced the first William lecture, Williams lecture in 2005. She said, Professor Williams recognized that fighting prejudice requires a relentless and determined effort. He concluded a 1989 article for the Vermont Law Review with this closing passage from the Matthew Arnold poem, Dover Beach. And here we are as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. Karen said, this seems an apt description of where we find ourselves today, which makes the need to speak truth to power all the more important. The story of Professor Norman is a story of VLS, and we carry forward his strong sense of purpose and conviction to question power and use the law for good. And it's an honor to carry that forward today with Professor Nolan, and I'll invite the other Professor Nolan to come up and give him a proper introduction. The other Professor Nolan, I like that. <laughs> Better than the Professor Nolan Jr. So that was. Uh, so this is a pleasure. Uh, it's a wonderful moment for me uh, and for the school. This is like bring your parents to work day. <laughs> so wonderful moment. Uh, um, in uh, as you can imagine, in crafting this introduction, uh, I have a lot of material to work with. Uh, and I could probably find some embarrassing moments uh, to highlight at this moment. Uh, however, the fact that my two children are in the audience tonight uh, suggests that I exercise restraint <laughs> and uh, demonstrate that one can model respect for one's elders <laughs> by sitting up. There you go, good. <laughs> so. <laughs> so uh, Despite the fact that um, our speaker tonight um, is known around our household as Tricky Granddad, uh, I will not be telling any embarrassing stories, so you can breathe a sigh of relief. Okay. He doesn't believe me yet. Um, so, I, I know tonight's speaker um, as a patient and wise parent, as a generous and supportive boss. We worked together for about 10 years before I came to Vermont Law School and a thoughtful, insightful colleague since then. Um, many professors and scholars know tonight's speaker as a towering figure in the field of land use. He has written 50 law review articles, uh, multiple books and chapters, countless other contributions to popular journals. His 2002 article titled, The Advent of Local Environmental Law, was the first article that identified the critical role that local governments play in protecting our natural resources. And this is in addition to the state and federal governments. It has been cited in over 70 publications. Don't know if you knew that. I did not know that. You don't keep track of that on a weekly basis? Okay. <laughs> Many government officials and developers and community activists know tonight's speaker as a committed servant of local governments and an advocate of local action. He is often a mediating voice in the cacophony of dissent that often surrounds land use developments, and planning activities. Many graduate students in law and forestry know tonight's speaker as a committed, talented, creative, humorous, and caring teacher. And I will tell one story. Uh, during, I, before going to law school, I decided to go and look at a law school lecture, and I decided to go to see one of my professor's property, my, my dad's property classes. And um, I, th th I heard the lecture, and then afterwards I turned to the student next to me and I said, what do you think of this professor? <laughs> and she looked back at me and she said, oh, the professor's pretty good, but the material's a little dry. <laughs> All right, so so I, I told this to my dad afterwards, and instead of, you know, what I sort of expected him to do was say, well, you know, it's property, what can I do, right? 
Instead, he said, well, I, that's interesting. I'm really going to apply myself and try and make it more accessible. How can I really help them to understand this material better? So even after 17, 18 years of teaching the material, uh, he still continues to try and improve his teaching. And I know that because he will call me on a, sometimes a yearly basis to ask me questions about how to improve his class. So he's a committed faculty member and teacher. Professor John Nolan is a distinguished professor of law at the Elizabeth Haub School of Law, where he teaches property, land use, and sustainable development law courses. He served as a consultant to President Carter's Council on Development Choices and President Clinton's Council on Sustainable Development. He served on the transition teams of two New York State governors, and he is on the editorial board of the Land Use and Environmental Law Review. He has received dozens of awards, including actually the same award that Norman Williams received from the American Planning Association, the National Leadership Award. So just 19 years later, something like that. I could go on with the awards and the accomplishments. And while all of these accomplishments are worthy of our respect and praise, uh, in my honest opinion, his most significant contributions to this community uh, come from his service. Service to community, service to students, Long ago, I don't exactly know when, but it's been a long time, as long as I've been in law schools, maybe two decades, my dad made a commitment to, with his scholarship, to engage students and to work with students. And instead of holding up in his office and cranking out articles for his benefit, he gathers students around. He involves them in the, in the process of exploration, in the process of discovery, and in the process, then, of creating the scholarship. So tonight, is, he's told me, is a showcase, a celebration of that creative, student-centered, service-oriented research approach. So won't you please join me in offering a warm Vermont Law School welcome to Professor John Nolan. wanted to give this lecture for a very long time. Sean did not know that. And when it reminded me that when uh, Bobby Kennedy was appointed Attorney General by his, by his brother, his brother was criticized for nepotism. And he said, no, no, it's just that success in Washington is relative. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sean. I have a bit of a story for Sean, but I want to save it for a minute. Thank you, Tom, Dean McHenry. Thank you, Jenny, Dean Bushlow. Um, before I get to Sean's story that I have to tell, I want to tell a little about Norman Williams. And you mentioned it, Jenny mentioned it, that um, I started my practice when he was in, 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 in full, sp full stride. And he had done a multi-volume treatise on land use law, which was amazing. And I had that by, by my side. I didn't take land use in law school. I don't know why, but nobody called it to my attention like I'm going to try to do for all these wonderful students that are here today. But I had got myself involved, and I realized how magical it was and how much we could do with it and how creative it was and how many problems we could solve with it. And I had that multi-volume set with me the whole time that I was learning the law. And so in preparation for tonight, I went back to that treatise, and I went to his casebook. Believe it or not, he wrote a two-volume casebook for land use law. And I looked, at the, um, I looked at the introduction that he wrote for the students that were going to read the casebook. And the last sentence that he, got to look up there. The last sentence that he wrote in this introduction is up here. Find, this is a guy who spent his entire life capturing appellate cases, talking about appellate cases, figuring out what they meant. His entire life was spent on this. Finally, in his introduction, he said, a word to the wise. If experience teaches anything, it suggests that not all wisdom is derived from appellate opinions. Life in the real world is quite different. Life in the real world is quite different. In a word, read, mark, and inwardly ponder these materials, but don't believe a word of it. <laughs> now, my story about Sean is that, um, that's not right. Yeah, it is. OK. My story about Sean is that when he took over the Land Use Law Center as its executive director, 
he took our program that was our signature program and took it to scale. We had a program where we took students out into the field, we trained local leaders, we tried to engage where there were problems on the ground, and the students sat with us as we were training these leaders, and they came back to the law school and had identified problems that they had to do research on to inform the leaders how to handle those problems. So Sean took this to scale, and we had an academic center created that, that, that trained all these students, and the students were putting out all kinds of reports. And Sean one day came to me and said, Dad, you know what we are? We're, we're pracademics. It's the first time I heard that word. I don't know if it's your word, you invented it, or somebody else did, but you're, we're pracademics. And I, I love that because that's exactly the idea that I was saying to Jenny that the formula for law school to me is very simple, right? The students pay the professors, and the professors need to train the students to get jobs. And if you don't put the students in the real world, it's going to be very hard for them to get jobs. I know people disagree with that, but that's my view. And Sean captured that perfectly. He might also have called us matrademics because the mothers of our children, who are both here tonight, have been so instrumental in our thinking and our strategies and our, they've helped us, they've moved us along. We've both been non-traditional in certain ways and I think we've been encouraged to do that and we needed that and we have to thank our wives very much and also thank Ian and Ty for being here. It's really for your generation that we're doing all of this, that if we can't figure out how the law can provide the potable water that we need in our society and deal with climate change, we're gonna be in serious problem and we're gonna owe you a terrible debt. So thank you both for being here, Ian and Ty. The uh, LULA, we call it, right? The Land Use Leadership Alliance Training Program is our signature program. And it takes us into, in, in Westchester County, can I say, talk about your dad a bit? Barnabas McHenry is one of the most famous men in my life. He has been extremely important in Hudson Valley, keeping it an environmentally pristine place and an ecologically functioning place. And in that valley, we have 260 local governments that are all bumping up against one another, trying to figure out how to get tax base and housing and do all these things that they do. And in that area, we've been doing these training programs with 30 or 40 people from local governments that, 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 that are working together with one another, we hope. And one night in the Sawkill watershed, I was working, training, this is about two years ago, training the leaders, and this one woman got up and she said, Professor Nolan, I'm on one of the planning boards that has jurisdiction over the Sawkill, and I've got a family member who is dreadfully ill because of water pollution. And I wondered why you're up here telling us that we have to solve this problem. Isn't this a problem of federal government? What's the EPA? What's the federal? Isn't there some clean water or something? Why isn't the state? Why do we have to solve this problem? Why is this our responsibility? And she said, can you explain the water law system of the United States to us here tonight? And I said, no. And thank you for laughing. <laughs> I bumped into two of our law professors before I came up and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to explain the water law system. You know, they laughed. It's very, it's very fractured, very complicated, and it's embarrassing. It's frankly embarrassing to be in that place, working with people at the local level, not being able to explain this system of law that is water law. So what we've been doing for, for two years, well, a year and a half, that was last, a year ago last summer, is we've had this project that we call the Calming Water Project local solutions, and we're trying to build from the ground up where the water is a system of law that integrates the state and federal and regional and other influences. And we've used our students to do that, and it's all that same LULA program, Sean, that you built so well that uh, is allowing us to do that, so thank you. So that meeting with Margaret was very important, and I brought her story back, and I recruited a bunch of students. Chris Denny, thank you for coming tonight. Chris, frankly, is one of the students that contributed the most to our research. Um, he's a Vermont law student, but he's also a Yale student. He's there with Kate Klaus, who was recommended to me to work on this project. They weren't at this workshop, so they aren't in the picture. And Tony Mazza, who's our joint degree student in the forestry program, who's an amazing young man, the three of them worked with us. And they, we've got all together 14 different students working on this project, trying to help me answer Margaret's question, right? It's a big job, These are, this is a great group of people. Now, when you think about 
when you think about what was going on here, there are five 1Ls at Pace Law, Stu Law School, and then there are five 2 and 3Ls, and three students at Yale. Uh, that's actually, there are there, six uh, 2Ls and 3Ls. This is like an ecosystem. And what's happening is that these 1Ls are bringing all the information that's coming from their PhD professors in undergraduate school into this system. And they're interfacing with second and third year law students who are taking courses from me and my colleagues who are bringing all that information into this system. And then we've got Chris and Kate and Tony at Yale bringing the information that they're learning from their professors there. And we're all churning this information, right? The question is there, how can we explain this system? What do we do about, it? how do we fix this system? I have all this information coming from up and sideways and down. And it's like what Murray Gell-Mann, a, a, a physicist who won the Nobel Prize for Physics in the 70s, called a complex adaptive system. And what he showed through his research is that a complex adaptive system, which can be a human organization, it can be a community as well as an ecosystem, it has to have components that, com that, that communicate with one another. And if they communicate with one another, they're all sharing information about their quarter of the, of the world that they inhabit, yes? And he proved that the, that, 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 that the complex adaptive systems that work that way, that exchange information that are connected, succeed and thrive. And the ones that don't, do not do so well. So that's the model that Sean helped us build at Pace Law School. In the Lula training program, where we focus on local solutions, and I'll explain more about this principle of subsidiarity in a minute, in the, at, at, at Pace Law School uh, and in this, in this training program, we always tell jokes. We're up to 30 routine jokes now that we tell. I gave Tiffany a book, 30 jokes. The number one joke that we tell is about Johnny. And Johnny is asleep one morning. His mom comes into the bedroom and says, Johnny, wake up, you gotta go to school. And he said, give me five more minutes. And she says, okay. And then comes back, five more minutes, okay. She comes back, five more minutes. Finally, she says, Johnny, get up. You gotta go to school. And he said, I don't wanna go to school, mom. And she said, why? He said, well, because the teachers call me names and the kids throw things at me. She said, but Johnny, you have to go to school. And he said, why, mom? Why do I have to go to school? And she said, because you're the principal. We say to these leaders that they're the principals because in our system of government, which I'll explain a little bit better in a minute, they have all the relevant power to decide what goes where on the landscape, what gets conserved, what gets developed, and how those two work together. Let me say that again. Local governments in our system of law have the principal responsibility for determining what goes on on the landscape. If you don't like it, it's because of the local government, the planning board, the zoning board, and the local legislative body. So we use that, and I, I wanna put myself in good company tonight by reading from two respected, at least by me, journalists, one David Brooks, the other James Fallows. David Brooks, you all know, probably is a columnist for the New York Times, and he wrote a, he's very much into localism. He wrote an article called Under Localism, and here's a direct quote. The crucial power center is at the tip of the shovel where the actual work is done. Expertise is not in the think tanks, but among those who have local knowledge, those with a feel for how things work in a specific place, and an awareness of who gets stuff done. Now, James Fallows is a very celebrated columnist for the Atlantic Magazine, and he thinks very highly of what happens at the local level. He traveled with his wife throughout in a, in, on an empirical investigation. He traveled all over the country at the local level. And they said, you know, if you judge this country based upon the civil dialogues that happen at the local level and the problem solving that's happening among people of various opinions, you'd think we were getting along very well. If you read the national press, it seems like we're falling apart. But at the local level, things are really working. And he, in, in his recent article on localism, he ended with this, I thought, remarkable statement. The evidence of past waves of reform from the labor rights and women's suffrage movements of the early 1900s through the civil rights and environmental movements of mid-century suggests that national transformation must always start from local roots. 
So tonight I want to build a local foundation for our water law system through local solutions. Now, I had an opportunity to write a book for ELI on disaster, natural disasters. This is after Katrina. We were all very concerned about the fact that we continue to rebuild and redestroy our houses and, and businesses. We wrote a book for ELI called Losing Ground, and I got a lot of very intelligent people involved in that discussion, including Robert Ellickson, who some of you know is a law professor from Yale. And uh, I got him in a workshop. We were talking about this whole thing. And he, he said, you know, we suffer from the Yale disease. I said, the Yale disease? What's the Yale disease? I was almost afraid to ask. He so said, the Yale disease. He said, all of my students only want to learn federal law. They want to learn federal cases, and they want to learn federal statutes. And that's fine. We, we need to know that. We've done a lot of very good things under federal law, but they need to know about lo local governments, too. And he was the first person that taught me the principle of subsidiarity, which is a concept in social, in social science and political science that says that the responsibility for solving a problem should be delegated to that level of government that is the most decentralized. In other words, local governments who have power should be trusted to solve problems at the local level. The principle of subsidiarity is a huge principle in the field of, um, of um, of political science, and on my way up here, my wife, who runs a pretty considerable organization, was saying, you know, it applies to my business as well. You, that, that kind of delegation of authority to people who know what they're doing, the tip of the shovel, to, to quote um, David Brooks. So these are just a list. I don't have any time to do this tonight, but these are the lists of the major theorists that we look to to remind us that what we intuitively find works solving problems on the ground is is, is in accord with very good theory. We've got Eleanor Ostrom, another Nobel Prize winner, the only woman, I think, that's won the Nobel Prize in economics. Murray Villman, who was uh, called a man that knows everything by the New York Times. Uh, Everett Rogers, who was the, the steward of the whole idea of diffusion of innovation and how change happens at the local level. My students at Yale came up with a perturbation. I taught for uh, 15 years at Yale in, in the uh, forestry and environmental studies program, and my Yale students went out to find out why were all these local governments adopting local environmental laws, and they came back and said, it's because they're perturbed. They're upset. They got a problem, and they went to solve it, and they found a law, and, they, and then they adjusted the law, and they adopted it. And they said, that's, Professor, that's the perturbation effect. <laughs> so that's my theoretical contribution. Again, I owe it to my students. OK, so here's what Professor Ellickson's students want to learn. And I call it, for a reason, troubled waters. This is the federal water law system based upon the Clean Water Act, which prevents water pollution. And it works like this. The Congress said that the federal government has the power to regulate navigable waters, and then said that the, the, in the Clean Water Act that it, we, we are going to regulate the waters of the United States, which are fondly called WOTUS, waters of the United States. Okay, but in the, in the Clean Water Act, they only gave themselves the power, the federal government the power, to regulate point sources of pollution, which are primarily like pipes, effluent pipes that come out of factories and other discrete uh, conveyances that come into, into the waters of the United States. Non-point source pollution, that diffuse pollution that comes from land development and land use and all these different things that we do on the landscape, is not subject to federal regulation, nor is groundwater, which is one of the biggest sources of drinking water. So when we were explaining this whole thing to Margaret, she was a little confused because she didn't understand why the federal government couldn't solve her problems. Now, the way that the system works is by permit, and you need a permit if you're going to discharge a pollutant from a point source into a WOTUS. That's it. You need a permit to do that. And the problem is that the definition by the EPA, Congress didn't define WOTUS. They didn't define navigable waters. They didn't use a traditional definition of navigable waters. They just said the word navigable waters. And so they've defined the surface waters and wetlands and other related waters that are subject to the term included in the term WOTUS 
uh, a very limited amount of our water in this country. As I've already said, it doesn't regulate groundwater. It, re it leaves out isolated interstate waters. It leaves out artificial lakes and ponds, some ditches, ephemeral features. Under some changes in the clean water rule that are pending now in the Federal Register under the Trump administration, non-adjacent wetlands are gonna be excluded from federal jurisdiction, and that includes anything that doesn't have a surface connection. That's a huge change. 54 square miles of Chesapeake Bay are taken out of regulatory authority of the federal government by that provision. It, it's amazing uh, how, how, mu how much of the waters of the United States are being taken down now for federal jurisdiction because of that. So here's just to one point about trying to get into the regulating groundwater, which is so important. What if a point source of pollution discharges into an aquifer, a groundwater aquifer, that itself discharges into a WOTUS? I mean, now imagine it's late at night, I'm trying to explain this to somebody in the Sawkill watershed. I could say, well, the Ninth Circuit and the Fourth Circuit think that's kind of okay. That would be a way of gathering some groundwater that we might be able to bring under the umbrella of the Clean Water Act, but then the Sixth Circuit disagrees and the Second Circuit doesn't know. It's got one case, but they put it on hold because they're settling it. And by the way, the Supreme Court has issued a writ of certiorari to figure this whole thing out, so we have no idea. Okay. <laughs> this is Margaret. And she's saying, isn't my problem groundwater pollution? Isn't my problem non-point source pollution? How can my problems get solved, right? And by the way, and here's a tip of the hat to Tony Mazza, who is my student at, at Yale. By the way, isn't all water connected? Isn't hydrologically every water system that we have connected? Why is the law not as unified as nature, as the water system? Right? This is what Margaret wants to know. So let me take a little detour here and talk about why we use the term calming troubled waters. Um, when you're talking to somebody like Margaret, the direction from which you approach the problem is very important. I had chosen to explain what can be done through local law rather than to start with federal law. And let me, introduce, let me, let me illustrate this by this uh, uh, experiment that Ben Franklin did in 1762 in Chapman, England. He wrote up his experience. It was published by the Royal Academy of Sciences in England. And his, here's what he said. Here's what he wrote. At length, being at Chapman, where there is on the common a large pond, which I observed to be one day very rough with the wind. I love this rhetoric. I fetched out a cruet of oil and I dropped a little of it on the water. I saw it spread itself with surprising swiftness upon the surface, but the effect of smoothing the waves was not produced for I had applied it first on the leeward side of the pond where the waves were the largest and the wind drove my oil back on the shore, stood on the wrong side of the pond. I then went to the windward side, standing on the windward side where the waves began to form and where the oil, though not more than a teaspoonful, produced an instant calm over a space of several yards square, which spread amazingly and extended itself gradually till it reached the lee side, making all that quarter of the pond perhaps half an acre as smooth as a looking glass. It mattered where he stood. When I talked to Margaret, I stood on the windward, I, I stood on the, on, the, on, the, on the windward side where, on, on the windward side where there are troubles, the local level. And we approached it from that local level up, not on the leeward side. So, oh, this, Anne, I don't know if you remember this. Anne and I got this sign in Boca, in, Boca, in, in Buenos Aires when we were down there. And uh, it says it's prohibited to spit on the sidewalk in Spanish. And underneath it, it, it says, this is according to a, a, a local ordinance adopted in April of 2009, right? So we've been governing at the local level non-point source pollution for a long time. You can't spit on the sidewalk, that's non-point source pollution. So let's talk a little bit about non-point source pollution. Here I tip my hat to, to, to Chris for a lot of his work with Tony and Kate in giving us this, this information. But um, what happens in nature is that we have this hydrological cycle, and the rain, it rains, there's precipitation, there's 40% evaporation. 
uh, I can't really read this, 10% uh, runs off and 50% filters into the soil and gets into the groundwater aquifer, right? When we develop, we urbanize, depending upon how much urbanization we, we're talking about and how much impervious coverage there is, like roofs and buildings and sidewalks and roads covering the soil, on an average basis, an urbanized area will have 30% evaporation. Look at this, 55% runoff and only 15% infiltration and only 5% deep infiltration. Now imagine what that does when you urbanize a place to the environment and spe specifically to, to water, both surface water and groundwater. So the impact of land development on the environment is very, very clear and it involves pavement, driveways, sidewalks, recreational courts, buildings, hard packed dirt. Impervious surf surfaces like that cause rapid runoff, which comes from diffuse sources of unregulated non-point source pollution by the federal government and prevents percolation of stormwater into the soil and groundwater. Land development involves heavy equipment, which cause soil compaction. That crushes the soil structure. It impedes air, water, and root movement. It causes more runoff. And then the grading that happens in development takes off the organic layers and leaves clay-like impervious soils. And then the runoff comes with sediment, which is the greatest single threat to water quality. Nutrients attach themselves to the soil particles and wash into the surface waters. Those nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen cause the plants to grow and eutrophication happens. The plants grow, the plants die, the plant's death provides food for the decomposers and decomposition takes the oxygen out of the water and the fish die. That's just a few things about development and the environment. So here's what we need to understand a little bit better and that Norman Williams understood in full. The federal constitution has a clause that says that the federal government has the authority to control interstate commerce. That's why waters of the United States are so limited because not all waters can be connected. Creative people can connect a lot of water with interstate commerce, but the Congress really can't and the EPA isn't and certainly Justice Scalia wasn't gonna do that. So, but that's where the source of power comes from. The constitution of, the, of, the, of, the, of our nation also has a 10th amendment that reserves all powers not delegated to the federal government to the local government, I mean to the state governments, yes? In state constitutions, we have the people giving the state government the police power, which is a power to regulate in the public interest, the public health, safety, welfare, and morals. That police power is given to the state's legislature and the state's legislature have decided in their wisdom in all 50 states to give that power to local governments to regulate private land and private land development. That's uncontrovertible. That is our federal system, starting at the federal level and working all the way down. And so it was there that we learned that local government had so much power and there's where I started my talk. That's the side of the pond that I, I, I wanted to stand on. And I want to just take a little break and talk about Willie Sutton for a minute. You all know about Willie. He was one of the most famous bank robbers in our country in the 70s and 80s. He, he escaped arrest for a good long time. He was almost a, 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 like, a, like a star. They finally caught him and a journalist walked up to him and said, Willie, why did you rob banks? He said, well, it's because that's where the money was. <laughs> so Willie knew which side of the street, what part of the street to go to. Ben knew which side of the pond, and we knew to start at the local level and talking to Margaret. So Margaret, here's what federal law cannot do. And this is just all data and information and case studies brought back to us by our students. They went out, they studied, they found, they got dozens and dozens of examples. I just cherry picked a few because Folks up here at Vermont Law School didn't want me to talk too long, so I just have a few to go, to go into. Here in Illinois, the city of Crystal Lake has adopted a watershed design manual that requires developers to put in permeable pavement, which solves the impervious coverage problem in part and prevents runoff. In the village of Bangkok, Burn in Illinois, they give incentives for private rain gardens on private residential properties which filter and minimize pollutants, so you can see local government's beginning to mitigate those negative environmental impacts.
in the town of Goshen, they created, with Sean, when he, Sean, you and I worked a lot on finding overlay districts back in the day. An overlay district uh, understands that you might have three or four zoning districts of various types in a particular area. They were put together before we really had very much environmental knowledge of that area, and there could be a watershed that, there that, over, that, 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 that expanded itself over three or four zoning districts. And an overlay district was a way of identifying a natural resource and identifying some additional regulations and standards that ought to be applied to protect that resource, leaving the underlying zoning in place. And Goshen took that, and look what it did. It created an overlay district for a ponding area, for a stream corridor, for a reservoir watershed, and for a groundwater aquifer. Now, I want to say something about law and lawyers. The lawyer for the community had to figure this out. The municipal lawyer had to tell the municipal council, the town board, that you can do this, right? Town boards just don't think like this. They're doing too many other things. So um, everything I'm going to talk about, it, was, it was, came out of the mind of some genius lawyer. Here in Kentucky, we have a county that is controlling the sediment from mines. That's non-point source pollution writ large, and they're doing it at the local level. And then in, in, in Wyoming, we've got counties being empowered to regulate CAFOs, swine facilities, and make them have really useful and, and effective water management plans before they can go into operation. In, um, this is a good story. Um, in Colorado, Oregon, Wisconsin, and New Hampshire, we found a bunch of smart growth, smart growth techniques that were being used to conserve water. Five years ago, we got taken by Western resource advocates out to Colorado, and we took Sean's Lula, and we trained 15 communities in the front range of the Rocky Mountains. And their problem was that this is Colorado. They have 5 million people. They're going to 10 million people in 20 years, 30 years. They hardly have enough water for the population they currently have, and they're going to grow by 100%. And they needed to know how to conserve water. They're using water at the rate of about 220 gallons per day per person, if you can believe that. And a lot of it is because of the way they decided to develop their towns and their human settlements. And so we searched all over the country and came up with these ways of creating compact mixed-use developments, developments with smaller yards and more, more water-efficient facilities. And we put together this training program and we train people in these 15 communities to go home and start to ad adopt these things, and many of them have. But it, after it was over, we got a grant with Western Resource Advocates to write a book. It turns out that Sean's sister wrote that book. Jenny Nolan Blanchard, who is our senior staff attorney, we always have to have a second Nolan in the Land Use Law Center. Uh, about the time Sean left, she came, and Jenny is our senior staff attorney, and she runs our student research pro program. She's the one who's churning all this information and so Jenny was tasked to write a 300-page manual, which came out two months ago on this project. And it is chock full of techniques on how to conserve water at the local level, standing on that side of the problem. Now, what we figured out, and I could use some help with this after maybe the Q&A, one of you can straighten me out on it, but we're figuring out that water conservation also leads to water quality. It, it helps water quality, because the less water you're using, the less wastewater you're generating, the less pollution there is, yes? And so now all of a sudden we have all this work that this new group of students did with the work that Jenny's students did for this Colorado project. And we've got so many different techniques that it, um, it, it's, it's, it's pretty impressive. And now we're dealing with water conservation and water quality. So here, just think about who, who, can, who can think this kind of stuff up? Pen, look at Pennington, New Jersey, adopted a local law that defines water pollution as a local nuisance. Now, look here. This law says that a discharge that causes the threatened pollution of any surface water or subsurface water, okay? If we were the federal government, we'd have to say, wait, surface, subsurface, we don't deal with that. And only some surface. So, it's, it's a local government. It has authority to do whatever it wants to do that doesn't violate landlords, landowners' due process rights. So here they came up with this. Now, what happens? And I, I know this is a little wonky, but for those of you who remember a little bit from your property course, private nuisances are hard to win because usually there's a reasonable use doctrine of some kind that you have to deal with, right? So in order to prove them, you have to show that the defendant has unreasonably used her water. 
And there's no standards for that. It's hard to figure that out. It's all contextual. You can look at the restatement on nuisance law and it's all a whole bunch of stuff being balanced, a whole bunch of stuff being, who knows? So if somebody comes to you and says, I'd like to bring a public nuisance action against my neighbor who's polluted my water, I'm not so sure we can win. We don't know, we can try. You can pay me and we can try. Once you get a statute like this, the duty and the standards become statutory. Yes? And now you've got a statutory nuisance. You've got something like a nuisance per se almost. But you certainly have a lot of help. So even with the common law, you can see how at the local level you can do things that jack up the ability for people to protect themselves from neighbor's water pollution. Here's another amazing thing. Okay, you all know that probably that local governments have the responsibility for enforcing zoning and building codes and then when you want to sell your property you have to deliver a certificate of occupancy to the buyer because the buyer has to show the bank that it's in compliance with law. It has to show the insurance company that's in compliance with law and has to show the title insurance company that's in compliance with law. So this CFO, certificate of occupancy, is a local authority. And some lawyer figured out for the town of East Fiskill that if we adopted a law that required well testing and that those well tests must show potability, then if you violate that law, you can't get your certificate of occupancy, you can't sell your property. Imagine what that did to clean up water pollution in East Fishkill. Some genius lawyer figured that out. Here, um, again, a tip of the hat to Tony. <laughs> by the way, there's a wonderful book by Richard Powers called Overstory. Have any of you heard about it? It's a phenomenal book about trees. And the whole metaphor of overstory, right, tells us that we're protected by the trees. They have real serious environmental functions that they, and they're protecting us. When I put this in Microsoft spell check, it's not a word. Overstory is not a word, and yet it's a hugely important concept. I talked to Tony about this. He said, well, our culture is catching up. But here's what happens. When it rains, the big raindrops coming very fast hit the soil and cause all kinds of sedimentation. We just figured out what's wrong with that. If they hit a tree, if they hit the leaves of the tree, those drops are broken up, and they're slowed down. And there's much less erosion, much less sedimentation. And Tony taught me that, it's, that a mature oak tree sucks up about 40,000 gallons of water a year. So imagine the, how, how it contributes to stormwater runoff, contributes to stormwater management, contributes to groundwater infiltration. So we found a community, of course, one of our students did in Leesburg, Virginia, that's committed itself to increasing its community canopy from 20 to 40%. The tree canopy, the urban forest is gonna be increased through zoning subdivision regulations, site plan regulation, capital budgeting, and other things to increase the tree canopy by 100% in that community. This is great, great legal work. Ithaca, I met the town, at the city attorney at, from Ithaca, and he said, we just adopted a stormwater user fee. And I said, what's that? I had never heard of a stormwater user fee. He said, well, we're spending about a million dollars a year to manage stormwater. And we figured out that we can, cut, we can come up with a user fee and charge on the basis of how much impervious coverage every property has, what that fee should be. And so we figured out that the average one, two, and three family home have about 2,300 square feet of impervious coverage and we came up with a charge of $48 a year and we created an equivalent residential unit and we hit Walmart with a $2,000 bill because it has two acres of impervious coverage, right? I thought that was pretty neat because that's good for the municipal fisc, treasury. But what they also did is that they said, if you do a green roof, if you do a pervious surface instead of an impervious surface in your parking areas, if you do any kind of engineered runoff reduction project, we'll give you a deduction on that fee and a significant one. So this lawyer turned this revenue collection thing into a, a way of protecting the environment. Amazing. Now, I'm gradually gonna try to bring this around to a more collaborative presentation. Um, we have to reinforce sustainability, subs subsidiarity, excuse me, with collaboration. There's a need in our system for connectivity. So there, if you read the literature, there are a lot of Law, law professors who write against localism, they're anti-localism, they think we're parochial, they think local governments don't have any assets, they don't have any capacity, 
they don't have a lot of smarts, and they sometimes are just stubborn, and they don't know a lot, right? But what we've understood as we've read those articles carefully is that what the critic, critics of localism are asking for is for local governments to be assisted, to local governments to be guided, for local governments to be given help. For them to be encouraged to work within systems that, that do more than just the principle of subsidiarity, giving them the power, right? So we're now working on finding examples of connected localism or tethered localism. The Moodna Creek Intermunicipal Watershed Agreement involves a state department, a state, two county departments, 22 local governments, and a bunch of NGOs. And the purpose of the Moodna Creek Watershed Council, according to the agreement, is to work together across municipal boundaries in order to protect, conserve, and enhance the water resources of the Moodna Creek and its watershed. There is that connectivity, that, that both horizontal across municipalities and vertical up to the county and the, and the, and the state integration. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we could have pulled out here. The EPA stormwater management requirements for local governments that have their own separate sewer systems. The Coastal Zone Management Act, the Disaster Ma Management Act of 2000. All of these laws, federal laws and federal regulations, create federal standards, invite states to get involved, and respect and involve local governments. These are nested hierarchies that respect the role of local government expected it's gonna be conducting that role well and give it assistance and guidance in doing so. This is very interesting. One of the critics of localism who wrote an article called Beyond Localism, which to me meant leave them behind. Beyond local, that's what it said to me. I read her article. This is what she, she said. She lauded New York State, which came up with a law in 2014 that said to the State Department of State, create sea level rise maps. Do four different scenarios based upon the best science we have of how much sea level is gonna rise and show us in our coastal communities which part of our communities are gonna be inundated because we need to know that if we're planning, yes, and developing. Local governments can't do that. And also, Department of State, create some model resiliency laws to give to those local governments to fix the problem that we help them identify. And then New York State's Department of Environmental Conservation just amended it's environmental impact review laws which require local governments and local planning boards in the process of approving subdivisions and site plans to do environmental impacts of their projects. And those regulations were amended about six months ago, effective January 1st, to require local governments to do climate change impacts, to, impact, to the impact of the project on climate change and the impact of climate change on the project. Now, when she got to that stage of her article, she said, this is exactly what we need to do. See, she wasn't against local government. She was supporting local government. She was saying, they need help. Here's the way that New York State has chosen to help them. And she thought this was one of the more progressive examples she could think of. So I've come up tentatively and with some hesitation with a new theory, Jenny. Theoretical law professor here, right? I, I, I tentatively came up with this new principle. I can't find in the legal literature, none of my students could find it. I sent the whole group out to find, is this term used anywhere we can find quickly? In the social science literature, or the legal literature, not there. So what we're saying is that we should establish this principle of collaborative subsidiarity that guides us all in our thinking about these issues. We like, we like subsidiarity because it solves problems. But we don't like subsidiarity because it just puts its finger on the local government and says, you've got to do this. This is your responsibility, yes? So what we need us to do is to collaborate subsidiarity, to, to combine it with collaboration, which spawn, responds, we think, to most of the criticisms of localism. And then we correct course through collaborative strategies. So remember what I said about this academic model? What I just described as a principle of collaborative subsidiarity is another model of how local governments should work with regional governments and with state government and locally in a complex adaptive system, which is all connected, communicating and sharing information and addressing that information based upon what that expanded knowledge gives us. So I wanted to make that point and then here I wanted to speak to the students that are here and um, first, thank you for coming. 
My God, you, just what you needed was hear another law professor talk for 40 minutes, right? Thank you very much for coming, and Ty and Ian, thank you guys for coming. Um, Margaret knew that the law was consequential. A lot of people know that the law is consequential, and she asked us a legitimate question. Why should she and her fellow local land use leaders have to use local law to protect their waters? But now that you've heard this, where else could they turn? Where else could they go? Neither the state nor the federal government has a solution to her particular problem, that community's particular problem. So if we want to advise clients regarding problem solving, we have to be specific and we have to have a tool. We have to have something in our toolbox that we can use, right? So if she had lived in East Fishkill, maybe her family member would not have contracted a serious illness. That, that tool is something that we need to have to advise local governments. So one of the things that we found is that we, we were in, we, two of this group of students and I, two weeks ago on Monday night, when we were invited back to the Salk Hill and 50 people came out in this great historic building and uh, we ate at a historic diner. We went to the event, 50 people were there. Two mayors were there, a bunch of planning board, zoning board members were there. A lot of environmental activists were there. Some developers were there. Some property rights people were there. And we had been asked to come and talk about the tension between property rights and regulatory takings, the tension between those two. And we were also asked to talk about how do you, given that tension and how do you resolve that tension, how do you control water quality problems, yes? So we started to work through the evening and we found out that they were extraordinarily hungry for information. This, we told them about our project. We told them all the things that we, we told you today, well, what we found. They wanted to know about federal law. They wanted to know about state law. They even asked questions about the common law. They were intrigued with this whole public nuisance thing. That made sense to them. And, 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 and they said, well, how can we solve these problems? We said, well, that's your call. But look, listen to the things that we've brought you tonight. Listen to these stories about what other local governments have done. And they got it. They knew that their governments locally have power to do the things that we've talked about this evening, I said to them, that they have these powers now, that the problems exist now, and they want to act. So we told them what they could do. And they are actively considering their options this week, this month, this year. Thank you. Don't be too rough on me. I'm Sean's dad. You love him. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Folks have questions, please come up to the mic because we're recording and this is the best way for us to hear you. Perfect. That's the end of the Q&A. <laughs> I think one of the role of deans is to make sure someone asks a question, right? <laughs> um, and I'm teaching water quality law this semester, and I forgot to assign this lecture, but I hope they're all here. Um, obviously can't explain, first of all, thank you so much, very thoughtful. You're welcome, Dave, my pleasure. Um, you were asked by someone to explain the structure of water law. Um, what would you want to tell the audience about what could be possible at the federal level, if anything, um, we could expect to see in the next year or two, in terms of water law, or maybe cutbacks in water law? And what might you see expect to see maybe in a state like Vermont um, with interesting and creative areas of local water law that might be of interest to the students. Thank you. Um, it's interesting how the definition of water is, is created. And Tom, you know this better than anybody. But it, 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 it's, a, it's, it's what, what is interstate commerce? What's in interstate commerce? What serves interstate commerce? And the environmentalist in, in us all wants the federal law to be coterminous with the hydrologic cycle, because that makes sense. And we can all see the impacts that anything that d damages water is gonna damage interstate commerce in some way, shape, or form. But that wasn't the Congress's interest. They had to stay within what they thought was the interstate commerce clause. And there's some cases in other areas of law that make that a very limited thing, right? 
and you have to show the re strict relationship. Was it in the Rapuano's case that Judge Scalia went to the Webster's second edition and came up with a d dictionary definition of water, right? And wetlands, and he used that to come up with the definition that that case, which led to the change in the clean water rule, which led to the dimin diminution of the amount of surface water and wetlands that can be created. So we're caught in this trap of limited power given to the federal government and people trying to, across the board, inter in interpreting the Interstate Commerce Clause being consistent in the way that they interpret it. And, any, and here's the thing, back when I was a kid, I remember people, I came from a big red state, Nebraska, right? And I can remember people screaming about federal rights and we have states' rights, right? And the whole thing is about state, the, the, the Clean Water Act recognizes the role of the states in protecting water and land as fundamental to the state power. So what you have is a, is a collision between what amount of power does the federal government have and that takes away from the local the state power. And that's a huge battle that goes all the way back to when I was a kid and before, the battle between states' rights and federal rights, yes? So it's a huge issue, it's a huge issue. But I think that the, 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 the movement is moving in the wrong direction right now, taking water out of the definition of those 54, acre, those 54 square miles in the Chesapeake Bay Area is a huge loss. And just imagine multiplying that around the country. I don't have an answer. But the state of New Vermont, particularly with the number of very small municipalities that you have, yes, um, has a great opportunity to pro provide the kind of technical information that local governments need. So if you go to, if you did a Lula training program in Vermont and had people come from 15 local governments, the first thing you do is say, what's your problem? We don't go to these Lula training programs and tell them what their problems are. We say, what is your problem? So local governments in these here parts have this problem. And then you go back to the law school and you get a bunch of people, the students, to work on best practices to solve those problems and go back to that group of people and say, this is what you should do. And by the way, if the state would help with information, technical assistance, training, those kinds of things, local governments would then be in a position to do a much better job of using those tools and techniques to meet their particular problems. I'm not sure that's terrific, but not as specific as I'd like to be. Okay. Uh oh, now I'm worried, I'm worried. <laughs> I, I'm Bill Take him out, Sean. <laughs> I, I teach economics at Dartmouth, and I'm interested in land use for my entire career. Um, the, the question I want to ask here is a trade-off uh, in CEQA uh, legislation, because uh, many economic studies have looked at uh, environmental regulations at the state level that are used at the local level as for exclusionary purposes. They, they, uh, the local governments. Uh, that want to uh, stop some development, uh, low-income housing or something like that, uh, are happy to find a, an endangered species near it and, uh, or, or, or some other uh, state or federal mandated. And uh, I worry a little bit. I, I think you're, 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 it's perfectly sensible that local governments do regulate water uh, and, and should uh, do it coherently. But there is giving them one more tool uh, to potentially exclude uh, desirable uh, development in a compact ways and things like this uh, might be problematic and I wonder if you would uh, like to talk a little bit about that trade-off. Sure. Um, the constitution of the state of X gave power to the state government to protect the people of that state. That's the power that was used to empower local governments to do the bad things that you just talked about. That's exclusionary zoning and that shouldn't be allowed. If you can show that a local government is using the power that it derives from the state constitution, which is to benefit the people of the state, that shouldn't be allowed, right? So we have to have lawyers that litigate these matters that can show exclusion and show why that's in, not in the, in the public interest. Now we have a case in, in New York like the one that, that Jenny mentioned, Mount Laurel in New Jersey, that makes that statement very clear. The second thing is that one of the big happen one of the big things that's happening in our field of law is the application of fair housing law to zoning, which was really advanced by the ICP case, the the um, ICP community 
ICP case, Texas Department of Housing and the ICP, Inclusive Communities Project versus the Texas Department of Housing. Um, in that case, Kennedy made it clear that the fair housing law applies to zoning. Minneapolis has just pledged itself to get rid of single family zoning, which is the most discriminatory and the most exclusionary. And some Oregon communities are thinking about doing the same thing. So here's a trend, yes? But what, what you're pointing out is that th these tools can be misused, but then we have laws and lawyers to kind of work on those as well. So I don't think that we should say that we shouldn't be able to have a, 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 a um, stormwater user fee in Ithaca because Ithaca might use its police power to exclude low and moderate income families. I don't think that's the formulation that you're suggesting. I think we just have to work hard on all these issues and be sure that the police power is being used the way it was intended. Hello. Um, I want to reiterate Ian McHenry's thank you for being here. Um, I was curious, a lot of our state's boundaries are made up of water. And I was curious if you or your students or the Lula program ever had any successes with different local governments on either side of the state boundary kind of overcoming that difference in being under different state, state government jurisdictions to come to a single local solution. Yes, there's no restriction on local governments working across state boundaries if they choose to do it voluntarily. If they want to do anything effectively together, they have to get the Congress, believe it or not, to approve that. So they did that in Lake Tahoe, where the federal government, Congress, adopted a law that permitted the two states to work together to create a regional planning agency there, California and Nevada. <clears throat> and that... Um, involves a lot of local governments and a lot of county governments and the two states and their agencies. And what they're doing there <coughs> is dealing with <coughs> both economic development and environmental conservation because the lake is an environmental resource and it's eutrophying. Yes, and it's losing its, it's, it's losing its emerald color and all of the marine life that goes along with that because of development doing all the things to that lake that I just said development does to the environment. And so they've been coming up with these, they talk about really interesting techniques. They have a, a stream corridor system and a transfer of development rights system. And if you're in a stream corridor system, you can't build, but you can transfer your development rights up the, up, upstream to something that's not going to drain immediately into the lake. And they're coming up with all kinds of local, of these kinds of things. And so that can be done in, 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 on the Delaware River, which divides New York and, and Pennsylvania and New Jersey. There's a major coalition of people that are working together with federal agencies. And so what we've learned is that, again, what I would start doing is work from the bottom up. And when you work from the bottom up, people say, you know, across the river, there's a problem there. I live in Terrytown, New York, which is right on the Hudson River, but it's on the east side. And on the east side, we created an intermunicipal council years ago, and then they got jealous on the west side and wanted to see the same thing, and then we helped them out, and then they'll get to put the two together, right? So we can be constricted by laws that tell us that we have to go to Congress to get states to work together and municipalities across state lines, but you can do that. You can do it informally. There's all kinds of solutions to these problems. The thing that the mood in the communities were doing was just agreeing to come up with comparable comprehensive plans because zoning is supposed to accord with the comprehensive plans. So if you can get seven or eight municipalities in the same watershed to agree to adopt similar components of a comprehensive plan, then you've got it made, right? And they can just do that. They can just, but the way that that has to happen is that they have to be educated about the relationship among the communities, environmentally and economically, to deal with these problems. So there's really no limit to that work that lawyers can do. Hi, um, so local governments are often kind of pigeonholed as, as NIMBYs, as, um, thinking that, oh, they don't want to spend the money to really upgrade their water systems, but uh, you've given us a myriad of examples about um, local governments really taking the lead, so it strikes me there's an image problem here and a bit of a disconnect, and I'm wondering if you have ideas about how to kind of shift the dialogue around it more towards these solutions rather than the, the challenge or the problems. That's why I'm here. Fair enough. And I'd be, I'd be happy to talk to you about what you think I could do more of because this image of local governments 
the irrelevance of land use law, the irrelevance of local government, the stubbornness of local criticism of local governments is just all completely wrong. And I know that. It took me a long time to figure that out. I was given 30 years to teach this stuff, right? I finally figured it out. We have to figure out how to do that. And, and I'm trying to come with this principle of, colla of, of collaborative subsidiarity. I'm trying to come up with something that will take the theorists and shake them a little bit and say, look at this. It's all there. It's all in that principle. Let's, let's work on that for a while. So that's my answer to the theoretical thinkers about these things. But for the people that want to solve problems, which all students do, look at the case studies. Look at what happens under the principle of subsidiarity. Look at all these wonderful things that lawyers are telling local governments that they, they can do. There's that old saying about don't make the, the perfect be the enemy of the good. This stuff that these local governments are doing is very good. So if you've learned tonight that you can do that either as a citizen or as a lawyer for a client, I'm happy. We need to do more of it. Thanks for the question. We'll have this be our last question. Uh, thank you for coming here. I appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank uh, Janet Milne for teaching land use. That's a wonderful class, and it really did teach me uh, quite a lot about that. Um, but uh, my, my question specifically relates to, um, oftentimes I think that uh, local municipalities typically are very uh, thinking only about sort of themselves typically and their own water quality and maybe perhaps like in a more agricultural uh, area or something like that, um, non-point source emissions from agricultural runoff might not be their priority to curtail or something like that. And I was thinking about um, how, how you think of Act 250 and whether or not uh, that's sort of um, like this comprehensive state ordinance that sort of works with local municipalities. Is that kind of what you're talking about um, when you're using the, um, the term that you were using earlier, the collaborative? Yeah. Uh, how, how is Act 250 done? Uh, it's typical, it, <laughs> so it's, so it's a state, <laughs> Well, that's, a, that's another talk, but it's a, it's a statewide zoning, uh, it's a statewide zoning statute that has uh, certain considerations for, for um, uh, like environmental. No, I know, I know what it does, but I'm asking okay. how, how has it done? Is it working? Uh, well, I don't, I don't think that it's working as well as it could be because I know that um, when it was in passed through legislation, it, a big part of it was cut off. And so I'm not, I'm not necessarily sure that it's like the best example of like a statewide yeah. zoning statute. But I think that oftentimes like the local municipalities are underfunded and they don't have the expertise necessary to be able to regulate these particular activities. And that I think that sometimes the state should step in and be able to regulate, especially I think agricultural runoff yeah. is, a, is I, a big one. I, I totally agree. Um, and I'm speaking without knowledge here, which is always dangerous, but I do it a lot. <laughs> um, if you're going to tell, how many local governments are there in Vermont? Anybody know? A couple hundred? 250. Not a bad guess, right, for a Yankee? Okay, so 250 local governments. If I were going to... there's no unincorporated areas, so every town... Yeah, there are no counties. There's no... There's no they don't have land use. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Um, if you read Eleanor Ostrom's theories on common pool resources and the, what she calls the panacea fallacy, this is a little bit complicated. She's saying that you need to engage people first where the problem exists and work from there up. So when you go to the state level and say that local governments need help and local governments are not doing their job, that can be deemed offensive. Local governments might not, may not agree. Mm -hmm. So what I would do if I were coming up with some kind of statewide program is work from the bottom up. And I have a, an outreach program and I'd go around to local governments and say, what can we do to help you? What can we do at the state level to help you? Mm -hmm. And build it that way. And maybe what they want to do is work together and have intermunicipal um, councils and get funding for that and work together across watersheds and agricultural regions and economic regions, yes? I don't know how Act 250 was put together, but when these things pop up, and there have been lots of attempts to take power away from local governments, mm -hmm. because local governments have been vilified for many, many years. Clear back in the 1970s, there was a whole national effort to come up with um, state preemption of local law and local land use law, yes. It's never worked because state po politicians are local politicians. They're all elected by local 
people. And if you start taking away local power from local people, you're going to get kicked out of office. So it's doomed to failure. You can't start at the state level and say, here's what you need, here's what you shall do. It won't work. It, it sounds great. I spent actually five years of my career on that in New York, and it just I got blown out of the water. It wasn't going to work. I couldn't even get a coalition together because of this powerful lobby at the local level. And, this, it, 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 and by the way, saying that uh, favorably, that's a big vote in favor of democracy, right? Local decision making is something that is very highly democratic. And look, John, James Fallows and David Brooks are seeing all this great activity in problem solving at the local level. So what you need to do is find out from the bottom up what the problems are and organize state help around those, right? Because mm -hmm. if you just say, I, I don't know, again, I don't know how Act 250 was decided, I don't know what's in the law, I don't know whether it was, you know, but if you start from the ground up, you educate people, you bring them into a conversation, you ask them what they need and then you provide it to them, that's a better way to start than go clear to the end and say we're going to solve all the problems from the top down. Mm -hmm. Very seldom works. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you so much for that talk, Professor Nolan. You're welcome. <laughs> no